So one of the fossils that they began to find was this, a trilobite, and that's actually what Otto was, was drawing uh, over here. The trilobites began to emerge in the Cambrian and the Silurian, so they're very, very old. And Americans began to find these in the railroad cuts that they were making through the rocks of the United States. They began to talk to people in England who were also finding trilobites, and they began for the first time. Now, again, we take this for granted, but it was not until the 1830s that people in Britain and the Americas began to imagine that those two areas of land had once been connected. So this is a new geological understanding of a past that is beginning to stretch very far back in time. So next time you see a trilobite, be excited about it. Um, the, the Industrial Revolution is also important because they are finding evidence of a time in the past in Earth's history that was full of what they now called, and this is a new term coined in the 1830s, fossil fuels. Fossil fuels is a term that is coined in the early 19th century, precisely during the deep time revolution. They're cutting through the earth, they're looking for fuel to power the industrial revolution. They find an era, a lost era, full of palm trees from a time when the whole earth was like the Amazon, a kind of um, what they called the carboniferous, uh, an era of carbon. And this was going to become, here's another key word from this time period, the natural resource that would power the Industrial Revolution. So the Industrial Revolution, the cars, the trains, are all part of the new ways of approaching the Earth that help get us to deep time. Okay, deep time is great, but it brings up a bunch of new problems. And these are so interesting. And I give them to you not as me telling you what to think, but as partners with me in thinking about how difficult this is to think about. So deep time presents a number of issues. Let me just give you the first one. The first thing is that deep time is an inconceivable concept. Charles Darwin is one of the many people in the 19th century who thinks about deep time, right? Evolution has to happen over deep time. And he says it is incomprehensible Intensively vast. He is one of many others who look at the idea of deep time, that the Earth is not 6,000, but maybe 10 million, 20 million, 4 billion years old, and says, that may be so, but I cannot conceive of that. So it's this startling new concept that by its very nature is an inconceivable concept. So this is wonderful for historians like me who like to imagine how people think about their world. To imagine a new idea that you cannot think about is an absolutely extraordinary thing uh, that is very, very fun for us to think about. So deep time also has a second problem with it, which is that it is existentially horrifying. <laughs> One thing we know about human beings is that we like to be the center of the universe. <laughs> Nothing matters unless we are part of it, unless we are folded into our own history of the universe and the history of the Earth. It's hard to understand why it should matter. And deep time presents this problem in a really, really palpable way. The Bible ultimately is about human beings and how you get from then to now. And the Bible has at its very center the sense that human beings are God's special creation. Deep time does not have that assurance. It removes humanity from the story of life on Earth, from the story of Earth, from the story of the cosmos. You can have as many strata as you want but if none of them contain human beings, and if none of them contain the things that human beings are good at doing, which is having events, right? We have events. We have events like this one. And events leave documents. They leave traces in the historical record. None of those are present in these strata. So the strata present to people who could not before had imagined anything longer than a 6,000 year history that was in a document, it was in the Bible. The Bible had nothing to say about strata. So this was very, very um, unsettling, 
a book in which we were not even the act, not, not just not act, not the main actors, but not actors at all in it. So what do you do to fix this problem? Well, in the 19th century, we see a number of solutions emerging to this problem, which is to try to make the inconceivable concept of deep time conceivable, not only conceivable, but as we saw with the slinky unwinding of the Earth's history in the thing that you're going to look at later on when you go home, um, to make it beautiful, to make it relatable, to make it in some ways part of our own humanity, when in fact we know deep down inside that deep time doesn't really have humanity necessarily as part of it. So what do some of these images look like? Some of these are going to be familiar to you, but I hope that from now on you look at them as the evidence of the, the birth of deep time. So this is one of the many images to come out of some of the Grand Canyon exploring expeditions of the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s. This is William Henry Holmes' painting of the Grand Canyon. This is incredible, right? This is like strata central. Uh, looking uh, down into the Grand Canyon, you see all of these layer cakes of time. And look at these teeny tiny human beings. They're totally insignificant uh, in this larger canvas. But it is so incredibly beautiful that you don't care. And it is so incredibly beautiful, and I'm just giving you things to think about, right? You don't have to agree with me, just think about this, bear with me. Um, it is so incredibly beautiful that even though it is existentially horrifying, even though we as human beings are insignificant, we imagine that perhaps something like the deity might be there because it is so transcendently beautiful and it makes us think about eternity in the way that people in the 18th century and before thought about eternity. So one way to think about deep time images is as the secularization of the, Christ the Judeo-Christian idea of the cosmic eternity in the face of the scientific revolutions of the 18th and 19th century.